Hey, this is Ken Finnett at Capital Advantage Tutoring. It's my job to get you past the SIE. I'm saying that 14, 15 times already. So we've done 14 chapters already. Can you believe we've gotten that far? So we're up to chapter 15, and hope if you've been here this far, might as well keep coming. Got five more chapters to go, including this one. What is it 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20? So I guess it's really six. Six left. We have I'm on chapter 15. We've got to get to chapter 20. So this is compliance considerations, but just one second. If you like what I'm doing, please like, subscribe, share. If you also want to read along as I go through it, get the book. Go in my link, order the book from STC. Phenomenal book, phenomenal program. Another great budget-friendly program. If you can't, if you really don't want to spend the money on the STC, the Achievable Program, I have a link for that in there. Let's go. Let's do this. Okay, so Chapter 15 is compliance consideration. So this is all about like opening accounts and what the, what the, we've done kind of accounts, but this is more about opening the accounts and like what you have to do with record keeping and stuff like that. So really this is opening and updating client accounts, the Patriot Act, anti-money laundering, Reg SP, privacy, customer statements, and communication rules and protecting the ever-loving customer. So we're gonna start off with new account documentation. So here's the thing, when you open a new account, you have a lot of rules. So FINRA has a thing called KYC. You're supposed to know who your customer is. That's not the same as money laundering and all that. This is what it is. You need to know all the as many essential facts about your customer as possible. So you kind of want to get into that, okay? So you want to know everything you can about the customer. But what is required, okay? These are the stuff that's required. So what first thing you need, you need the customer's name and where they live. P.O. box is not acceptable. Yes, you can mail stuff to a P.O. box, but they can they have to have an actual physical address, okay? Two, you have to know if they're legal or not. If they're 18, that's always a good thing to do. Second, third, second, third, whatever you want to call it, you need the name of the rep and then the signature of the partner, officer, director, or the principal who approves the account. So here's what it is. You need the name. Are they so those who I do it? You need their name, you need their age, you need who, who the rep is covering it, and then you need the principal's approval. Boom. Okay. Now that's a retail customer. Okay. That works. Now let's keep on moving. Now, prior to settlement, so really with what they call within a reasonable time, you have to make a reasonable effort to get these three things. It doesn't have to get them, but you have to make every effort. You have to get the TIN number, which is, what do we know that as? The social security number. You have to find out what they do and maybe the where their employer lives. And you should try to get um, if they're associated with another firm. That one kind of is a no-brainer. That's a non-starter if you can't do that. So this is where it gets a little little fuzzy, right? Because it's not fuzzy, but it seems it. So Fender has rules that you're supposed to, what you need to get. You need to know their name, their address, are they 18, registered reps, signature, and the principal's approval by signature. That's what you need. And then you need, you're supposed to ask for other stuff, which just rewatch the beginning of the video. Now, the SEC has more requirements. They are, what they do is they hide it in this. They go, the broker dealer has to have on record the name, social security number, address, telephone number, and date of birth. And then they're supposed to find out whether the person's working or not, where they work, if they're working with a broker dealer. Then they are supposed to find out so they can make recommendations, annual income, their net worth, um, not including the residents, investment objectives, kind of like how much they know about a business. And then you start getting into the whole risk tolerance thing. But that's these are these are this is the beginning. So now, what if a customer goes, I don't want to tell you my net worth and my income? They can do that. You as a rep should sign something noting noting down that they're refusing to give that information. Now, if if the principal who's supposed to approve the account feels that the customer is not giving enough information to open an account, they can refuse it. That's their job. And remember something, you as a rep can't do trades before that. So that you can't like in the morning fill out the paperwork, do some trades for your customer, and then at the end of the day give it to your rep to give it to your principal to approve. No, it has to be approved before they do the first trade. Also, you should find a trusted contact person. It's someone that the customer chooses that you can contact them in case you again get in, in touch with the customer, okay? And it's basically someone that you can give customer information to that they've given permission for. It's a nice thing to have. You should try to do it, okay? Again, it's a reasonable effort to get it. You try to find a trusted contact person so if I can't get in touch with them or say they're, they're hurt or incapacitated or drunk or whatever it is, you have someone you can call and say, listen, can you help me out here? Okay, so the account's open. They're trading a little bit. Within 30 days, you're supposed to send the customer a copy of the account record so they can verify it. 
And then every three years, which is every 36 months, you should be updating and updating the client info. So again, you open the account, it's all good, it's approved. Within 30 days, you should be sending the inform the account record to the customer to confirm that it's all good within 30 days, okay? Or before the next statement, whichever is first, okay? Now, every three years, every 36 months, you should be updating the uh, customer's account stuff. So a lot of times what we did was we had a spreadsheet and every customer's name is on the spreadsheet. This is before you can put it in an algorithm, put in a spreadsheet and it would just clock off the time. And when it was about 30 months old, we would turn yellow and then it would warn us that we have a couple months left, really six months. But And then at the end of 30 months, 36 months, it would turn red and tell us you got to update the account information. So you call the customer and say, are all these things true? Are they right? Are they still the same? Now, anytime there's a change in information, whether the customer moves or anything happens, you should basically update it promptly, but no later than 30 days, and then send a record, the revised account record to the customer. Anytime something changes, you have 30 days, you, you do it as promptly as soon as possible, and then within 30 days, boom, send it to the customer to verify, to make sure it's good. And the reason you send it to the customer to verify is they go, oh no, this is wrong, you're catching it sort of soon. Know your customer in suitability. Not quite the same thing. Know your customer is knowing a much a, as much about your customer so that you can make decisions. So, like you know, if you know, are they methodical? Are they quick? Are they are they you know just basically everything you can about them so that you feel that you know them. Okay. So basically, you want to know, understand the financial needs and and the risk tolerance and all that of your customer. Part of the reason you want to do the KYC, know your customer, is this. So I have a friend who had a customer who was very methodical, took forever to do anything, never made a decision right away, always took two or three weeks to do yes or no. Not, not a quick thinker. But she knew that about him. So one day she gets an email saying, oh, please wire $50,000 to my account. I am putting a deposit down on a house. Could you please hurry up? She never talked to him about buying a house. He, she, she knew, she didn't know he's on vacation even. So she kind of questioned it. She went to the principal. They were signing off on stuff. So the principal come back and said, listen, I know you have your doubts. So what I want you to do is call him. And I couldn't get in touch with him, couldn't get in touch with him. So they said, send an email back and say, could you please do some stuff? So she sent the email and it still came back saying, yeah, please wire it, hurry up. She really felt uncomfortable because it wasn't like his thing. So she tried one more time. She got a hold of his wife. His wife said, hold on, got him. And he goes, what are you talking about? It wasn't him. It was a fake person. It was a person who wasn't, who was trying to steal the money, get him to wire to an account she never heard of. So by knowing your customer and this person knowing your customer knew not to do that. She knew it found it weird because if not, she could have just typed it and sent it. And that's a big risk, which we talk about in the prohibited activities later. But here we go. So now suitability. If I want to make a recommendation, if you want to make a recommendation of, to your customer at what to buy, you need a lot of information. OK, so you need to know everything they want to do is you need how old they are, not just are they 18, how old they are. Do they have other investments so you can fit? Remember, sometimes when you make a recommendation, you go, oh, a person's rich, you should have munis. But what if they already have a lot of munis? So then maybe you want to know what other investments are so that you can make it so it can fit in the pieces. Their financial situation, their needs. You want to know their tax status. Are they rich or are they poor? If they're rich, what do we do? Rich people buy munis, poor people buy corporates, stuff like that. Their objectives. Do they want long-term, short-term? Are they looking for saving for college, you know, or college or a wedding or a new house, stuff like that? What their experience is. Do they know what an option is? Do they know what a bond is? Do they know what an ETN or ETF is? You need to know this. Their time horizon. Time horizon is almost everything about suitability. The longer the term, the more risk you can take, the more room you have to make errors. Liquidity. Do they need the money right away? Do they have to have access to money? So a lot of people have a lot of money, don't have a lot of liquidity needs. Some do, but some don't. So the point is you want to know this stuff. Risk tolerance. How much risk they can take. I have a guy I have two guys that I deal with. One is if you buy stock at 50 and it drops a penny, he starts screaming and crying and going crazy. I have another person who, if they buy stock at 50, it drops to 48, she's buying more. So it's different things. You need to know their risk tolerance, okay? And any kind of information you can get from the customer to help you make decisions. Their children, are you know, are they right wing, left wing? Not that you care, but you want to know maybe you don't want to put them in certain products. So we want to try to get as much of that, what I, that list of stuff I gave you, you want to get as much as possible to get the most complete picture that you can. And you always have to put, you always have to make recommendations in your client's best interest. Not your, not because you got a Ferrari payment coming up, the customer's best interest. So you have to do something suitable. 
And just because a customer agrees to do something does not relieve you of the suitability obligation. So if you tell him to buy something and it's not suitable, and just because he says yes, you're still in trouble, okay? So you have to make sure that you're making recommendations for the customer's, okay, for, for the customer's best interest, okay? So basically, you can't pick one product over and over just for larger commissions, okay? You can't pick certain musophone ones, you know, do breakpoints or whatever it is. Basically, do breakpoint sales to try to keep them below a breakpoint to get a bigger commission. Basically, you also can't tell them to like, oh, you should use margin because we get bigger commissions, stuff like that. You have to do stuff that is best for the customer. So FINRA has kind of a three suitability obligations. One, reasonable basis, which means would this thing you're recommending be suitable to someone, at least some of my investors, okay? Two, is it specific, customer specific, which is it's suitable to my customer, okay? And then the third is quantitative. Does it fit in the in the portfolio, okay? Even if it's suitable, is it basically, is it too much, too little? It, so it's going to be reasonable basis. It's suitable for someone. Customer specific, suitable for that customer. And third, quantitative, it means you have to reasonable, you have to basically think, look at not just that one recommendation, all of the recommendations and all the portfolio to decide does it fit in in their in their um, what they need. Okay. Age based is one of the big ones. So the older they are, the less risky you can take. So I always do this. I do their age and bonds. That's a ballpark. Remember, that's a benchmark. So if they're forty percent, if they're forty, you put them like forty percent bonds, give or take, based on their risk tolerance. If they're eighty, you put them like eighty percent bonds or fixed income. And then you up or down it based on um, up or down it. That's not even English. Increase or lower it based on how, what their risk tolerance is. A uh, books like to do what a hundred minus their age and equity. Okay, I just do the way around their age and bonds. Institutionals, okay, institutional accounts are like money managers and hedge funds and mutual funds and banks. They're not really. They don't need the same protection as retail does. Retail's individuals, right? So retail has a lot of protection. So we have to protect them. So there's a lot of things they cannot buy. Institutions don't want those handcuffs. So they'll say, listen, I want to be able to buy these things that are not normally on the menu. So Finner came up and said, okay, we have to give something up because we're not going to protect you at the same time. So they came up with basically institutional suitability. Okay. So basically an institution can state affirmatively that it can exercise its own independent judgment and evaluate recommendations. Institutions, basically, they can make their own decisions. They're big boys and big girls. So that's what the institutional suitability is stating. It's a form. You fill it out. Not a form so much. There is a template for it. But you can actually, you can write a letter, have your the firm write a letter saying, we can make our own decisions and we can independently verify anything we have. That opens up the rep to be able to make recommendations without having to worry about every little suitability thing. They can't screw them over. But it does give them a little more leeway as far as recommendations go. Okay, that's the end of the first half of compliance. Oh, I changed shirts. That's weird. I think I shaved a little bit too. Um, please feel free to like, subscribe, share, go in the links, go on Amazon, but you know, maybe open an account at Webull, anything down there you want to do, have a little fun. Um, other than that, I will see you in a couple of days with the second half. Also, don't forget my lives, 8.30 p.m. Eastern every Tuesday night. Have a great night.